Kelly. I'm Shannon Lightman. And we are so thrilled to have you come together with us this morning. Um, Shannon and I had the opportunity to visit the schools in Benji and Amelia. And we want to share some of our big takeaways with you. How a community and a school feels about children influences how they approach teaching and learning. It's a big group. <laughs> so, what was so amazing is that 420 people from 40 different countries came together to share ideas and possibilities and dreams of educating children for the future. And Shannon and I are right I can't even tell, but yeah. I see our little heads up here. Oh, I can see. group. But it was nice to have conversations and to hear how similar we are and yet how different. And, you know, when, um, after uh, World War II, when Nazis had you know, they had occupied this area of Italy and really destroyed it. Um, the people came together. Boris Malthus, he was an educational philosopher, and he and the people in that community came together and they said, what do we want education for our children to look like? You know, and you can imagine how you want to, you know, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, you want, you're starting over. So when they built their schools brick to, by brick together, they also came together about the philosophy and what are the underpinnings. And so really, a school is set in the historical and social and political context of what is going on in the life of the community and what their beliefs are about children. So before I go into exactly what their beliefs are, I'm going to talk a little bit about, find out about your beliefs about children. This is another picture of us inside the actual Boris Malibu National Center with some of our new friends from Northern England and Australia. Well, and we should preface that you can only visit these schools in Reggio on a study trip. So it's not, uh, many people have said, oh, well, I'm going to be in Italy in a couple of weeks, maybe I'll drop by. You cannot do that. It is, um, they have such a special system of inviting different tours throughout the year. So they have a North American tour, um, they have an Australian tour, and Sherry and I were so lucky to be on the international tour because it included people from all over the world rather than just one region. So it was really unique in that way. I thought, because whenever I had looked at going before, I looked at just going um, with the North American um, Alliance. So it is, you really have to make sure that you're planning in advance and arranging the tour because it's a whole conference where they're, they're really teaching about the philosophy. Right. And, it is, and it's immersive. So our day started at 8.30 in the morning and ended at 6.45 at night. Um, but it was wonderful because you will be engaged in conversation and hearing presentations and doing things hands-on and then had opportunities to actually go into the schools and see and observe in schools while it was in action. And um, sometimes after school was over, meeting parents and teachers from the school and asking questions and having conversations with them as well. So this is another view from inside the, the place where we were spending most of our days. So the Red Amelia approach is based on the neuroscience and the psychology and culture, social constructivism, and ecological thought. So social constructivism um, it's really when you're learning alongside with the child and they're constructing their understandings from their experiences and their interactions with materials and people and experiences, and that it's in learning is a social experience. And so the theorists um, that it's founded on are Boris Malkuti, Piaget, Gatsby, Montessori, Freire, 
Bernard Gardner, Milani, Fainet, Milani, Minari, Bakuti, uh, Minari. And it's something that what Reggio was when it, in its first inception is not exactly as it is today. Just as education in our schools is constantly evolving, how you approach teaching and learning is changing too, because our lives change. Just like before we had um, iPads and iPhones and all of this technology, we used to parent even differently. And our school systems and how we use technology has changed. So even in Reggio, they're using technology in different ways too. When they, when they started these schools right from the very beginning, they, um, their, their quote above the very first school was, we started this school because we wanted something new and different for our children because they were underneath the regime of Mussolini and they never wanted that again for their society. They never wanted their children to just blindly follow authority. Um, so they began right from literally building the schools brick by brick. Mothers who began this because they wanted to, they needed to go back to work. So they they needed good schools, but they wanted something completely different so that their children would not fall prey to um, to to dictators, basically. So they wanted their children to question authority right from the beginning. So that was a, a really starting point for them. I think that's right. The, the, the focus is on critical thinking, communication, um, and collaboration. So this, this idea of knowledge being something that we build together in social context, starting with relationships. So the relationship with children, you know, in their schools, um, they're with the same teacher from zero to three, and then from three to six years old. So those strong relationships. The relationships with the families, the families are very involved in the classrooms and the life of the school, and then the school and the families and the children are very involved in the community. So they go out on field experiences and have investigations, and the community comes back in. And so learning is not something that is isolated. It's something that comes from all of these interactions and connections. And, and you have to understand that education for a long time was seen as this kind of funneling method of the teacher as a source of authority and knowledge. And it, she pours the information, or he pours the information into the child. This was how education was seen for a long time. So the Reggiani believed that they wanted to shift that perspective and move from not the adult as the um, initiator of knowledge, they wanted to move education into a more equality zone where the educators are learning alongside of the child. So the child is seen as a source of knowledge. So you, starting with infants, with babies, the teachers are coming in not just ready to pour information into the baby, but instead to what can we learn from the baby. So how are we learning alongside with together, passing, passing, they use the term of passing the ball back and forth, this um, creating a, a game almost together of the, the adult learning from the child, the child learning with the with the adult. And almost as how do children contribute to a culture? Um, so not just us bringing culture to children, but the children creating a context of culture to share with their community. And then there's the belief in democratic education, just like John Dewey has spoken, has been such a progressive educator, that the children are citizens, and they have rights as well. So before we go more into this philosophy, I'm wondering what is your image of childhood? And I'm hoping that you'll we'll do this popcorn style and we can go around the room and people just you know say some words that come to your mind when you think of childhood.
play. Freedom. That's my two. <laughs> Outside. Glory. <laughs> Discovery. Friends. Joy and wonder. <laughs> and I just the the way the Brettiani start every conversation almost with this image of the child of children. So when you think about a child and what your image is, what your image, and bringing your own context into that image, but then also what is the societal image of children and how, how that is taken into account. So if you can separate, like, maybe, I'm just curious to hear how you see it, how the child from your context, but then does it shift when you think about um, how our society, how our American society, how our culture sees children in the context in the larger whole. Does that shift how you think at all? I think as a non-parent and being around a lot of peers that aren't parents and thinking that projecting it to the society that doesn't have children, the view of children is more oppositional, I think. They're seen as lazy or destructive or annoying if you're not if you don't have a personal experience with a child doesn't have the same benefit, perceived benefit to you like you can learn from a child if you have no vested interest if they're not your child. Which is not I think that's really but important. I think that's yes. Something nice. Yes. Thank you. I think that's key. Anyone else want to remark on that? Um, just when you ask that question in like my perspective, um, whereas when you ask my ideas of childhood, the first thing I got was freedom. And I think the society and their um, attitudes towards children, I always think of this need to like, control and to put limits on. It's completely opposite of how I I think this is part of the struggle that um, the educators in Reggio had recognized that how the difference in how we can whimsically talk about how we see childhood, but then in all um, pragmatic sense of well, what's really happening with how are children affecting the culture of a city? And they really wanted to go a lot deeper with that in their city and how can children really actually be citizens of the city, not just seen as cute or um, uh, playful, but how are they actively citizens of this of this city? Right, and they view, and they view children from birth as citizens. So imagine that. I mean, that's, that, that's a statement in itself. From, from the moment you are born, you are an active citizen. So who do we want you to be? And I think that there's a self-fulfilling prophecy in the expectations that we put. So if, I, if people think I'm capable, then they give me opportunities to develop my capacity for being capable. If people think that I know things and I have ideas that are, and feelings that have value, and I'm, I'm in my teachers and the adults around me listen to my theories, that's really valuable. If we can act on their interests and explore things that they're wondering out about, how motivating is that to learn? Like we have to come from a place where we feel like children's ideas do have more that are, are are worthy of us spending time, you know, researching and exploring. And we have to notice what they're doing and not doing, what they're saying and not saying, what they're thinking about and hearing them understand, you know, what are their understandings, 
and how we propose things to keep them going and to keep them learning. And it's just a different approach, but it's an approach to come back and come in anywhere. So when I think of that first picture, you know, it's not that, I think some people think of Reggie Amelia as an isolated place, you know, but this is an approach. But this approach is for all, right? So in, it, in this world right now, I, you know, are, do we want to be global? Do we want to be nationalistic? Do we want our children to be able to think about different ideas and multiple perspectives and then come up with their own? That's really what this is um, helping children to realize that they can take in and think about what other people are sharing with them and then come up with their own solutions. So I would, I you know, I'd like to be in a world where children have, you know, they, they're respectful of multiple perspectives and their leaders and their leaders and their collaborators and their communicators. So this approach gives them many ways to do that and many means to communicate. So they talk about the rights of children. So that was something that when they began their schools, they right away said our children will have rights. And they and it's a constant discussion. Even now, 60 years down the road, or 70, whatever it is, um, what are the, they're constantly asking this question, what are the rights of children? So we are all, as Americans, very, um, composite of the rights of the people in our society. But are we thinking about what are the rights of our children? Um, how are they contributors to this society? How can we make sure that they know that they have rights? So they've done long-term projects with the children on what are your rights here in our city. It's a really beautiful um, idea. And very exciting. So they are trying to elevate early childhood and then the concept of childhood in general. And children are involved in the life of community in their school and in the greater community in their city. And so by giving them this visibility, um, we're seeing, you know, we're giving this ability to, their, to the children, to their intelligence, and competency to affirm they're being citizens of our society today. With the right to express themselves, and to be listened to, to be valued in their potential, to develop all the abilities they need in order to, and I love this part, to be protagonists and movers of their own future. That's really powerful. You guys will like this video. Um, so, I think when I first came back from Reggio, and I know Sherry and I both were just like, oh, there's so much, so much richness there, um, that I became very excited about the idea of, um, Wonder Studio has always built, been built on this framework of children as protagonists, but just to take it even further, and, um, so one of the focal points of the schools in Reggio is documentation of, of children's ideas and learning, but also of them as um, people who want to build connections with others. So I was able to get this video, and I guess I'll um, we do something at Wonder Studio called Quiet Observation Time, where we ask for one week of the session that the, the parents or caregivers be quiet and try not to intervene as much as they might typically intervene. So this video, I guess I would, what I'd like to see is your first reaction to the video and what your thoughts are. And then maybe we can look at it after I say, give you a little keyword and see if that changes your perspective. It's a short video.
poor video quality nuts. I'm an amateur. <laughs> so what are your thoughts when you first watch that without much context? Corey, you were there. Yeah. Well, that's my daughter, Juliet. So, um, I love the quiet time sessions. I feel that it's just such a nice way to let the kids interact without the adults intervening and you know telling them how to do things and stopping them, making them share. You know, I love being able to just see them communicate on their own. And these are young children who some maybe talk a little bit more than others, but they're they're just figuring it out. And it's just it's awesome to watch them, you know, interact with each other. And Shay was, you know, trying to show Juliet a little bit about the fall, and she was respectfully waiting and watching, and saying, okay, and, you know, then she jumped in and did it herself, and it was a tough thing to watch. I kind of felt like he was being an instructor. Like, I figured out what we're supposed to do here, and I'm going to show you what we're supposed to do here. We're supposed to take the fall and roll it down here, but I don't have the vocabulary to tell you that. <laughs> So I think the, what what is so brilliant about what I've learned from the schools of Reggio is that these little moments like this can so easily pass us by without us taking note of the brilliance of children. So often, as I know as a parent and even as a teacher as well, we get lost in um, focusing on behavior and is everyone doing what they're supposed to do? Is everyone safe? Um, I know especially as a parent, I can get caught up in, okay, just wanna make sure everybody's alive and safe. And so what's beautiful about just having this perspective of let's really look at the beauty of what children, what's happening with children um, through video, through documentation, through pictures, and see with new eyes this image of children as strong, like Rabbi was saying, um, he is taking on this role of the teacher, how powerful. And Juliet even, you know, she has this power of, I can, I can choose, and you can see her kind of take this stance of, I know what to do okay? You know, so, but they're having this interaction together and, um, which is really unique with this age group because typically at this age group they're really doing more parallel play rather than cooperative. So when we have this setting of the parents kind of sitting back, all of a sudden um, they can rise up to this new way of seeing each other and um, really being able to um, teach each other and be with one another. But then really, by having communicated it, all of us can reflect upon it and talk about it. And you can notice the gestures and the intonations and how he was really trying to have that one word, but he was inviting her to play. So it was a social experience. And then Juliet said, I'm going to watch you, and now it's my turn, right? <laughs> so it, but it was a whole exchange that was going on, and there were so many layers. Yeah, just, a, I mean, a 45-second video that can show just, um, you know, all he's saying is ball, ball, but he's saying so much more that, you know, it's this invitation. So, yeah, I don't think we need to play it again. You guys got it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this idea about children's rights from the very first day, and to that, to see their way of learning and seeing the book. You want to keep your sense of wonder built upon curiosities and their desires to research. And you want them to feel like they're respected and they can participate. And I really, I just keep coming back to this idea of the adults in the room having this very light touch and being willing to let go of our preconceived notions of behavior, being able to quiet ourselves and really allow the child time, time to have 
um, have these opportunities. It's just so important. And if if that situation, that video, had been set up any differently, if the parents hadn't, you know, been bossed by me to be quiet, <laughs> you know, maybe we would have missed it. We might have missed this opportunity. Um, to show how brilliant these two children were in their interactions with each other, how much knowledge they already have without us giving it to them. So a lot of times parents say, which is a wonderful question and you should ask, so what's my role? So what are what is the teacher's role in this learning process? If the child is the doer and the thinker, what are you, how are you, uh, what can we do at home to extend it? to promote that. So this talk a little bit about that. So um, this is Remy, who came to Wonder Studio, and um, he's a very just, um, I want to say boisterous, but that's not the right word. He's just full of wonder, really, is, is the right way to say it. And we had, uh, coming back from Reggio, I immediately wanted a bunch of plants. You know, there's just, so many things that you want to bring back from Reggio and I just felt like the most immediate thing I could do was to go get some plants and just put them in the studio space. I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so bringing in the plants, I wanted to see how the children would re react to having um, these little potted plants in the room. So, um, and I will preface, well, no, I won't, I won't say that. Um, Remy looked at the, the plants and he said, there's no bugs in the in the plants. And so immediately I said, Well, how could we invite some bugs into these into these pots? Because he's, he likes bugs. So this is a good thing for him. He wants bugs to be invited. And um, right away, without skipping a beat, because that's just how Remy is, he said, a slide! So he thought that if there was a slide connected to the pots of plants, then surely bugs would enjoy coming to, to this pot. So, of course, during class, we were right at this point where it was cleanup time, and I was just like, ah! <laughs> um, So I talked with his mom, and she's always so, um, as I feel like our whole community is, is very engaged in extending learning. And he, he did, when I asked him if he could build a slide at home, maybe, he kind of lost his confidence and said he didn't think he could do it. Um, I, I had asked him to draw a picture of what the slide might look like, and he, did, he, he kind of backtracked and didn't think he could do that. So I talked with his mom privately, and I said, maybe later on at home, bring it up to him, and again, it's called a relaunch. So you're relaunching the idea that you're almost working as the child's memory. You had this idea. Now, how can we do this? This was a good idea. And the, the mom working alongside, or a, a teacher working alongside of the child, acting as memory, and also kind of the instigator. And so providing materials, the context, and also um, some suggestions or questions that, that might help them get started. So this all started from Wonder Studio, right? Yeah, right. Because you were looking at the plants and then you told Miss Shannon, what did you say to Miss Shannon? There's no bugs there. Right? And then she said, Remy, can you think of a way to invite bugs into the plant? And you said, we can build a slide. And that turned into this. So can you see what you make here? Down the 
goes down that spine. And drop. Wait, what happened to the body? Oh, <laughs> okay. She's not there. I'm out. Bye. So cool. Oh, yeah. Why are you going to do <laughs> we solved that problem, let's move on. <laughs> on to the next learning adventure. The mom had said how she told me my idea that I had said of can you draw a picture of the slide? That wasn't his way, she said. He needed to use blocks and use paper not to write on, but instead to construct. She said, that's more of his way. And it just made so much sense to me because in Italy, in the schools of Reggio, they talk about the hundred languages of children and that you need to give children many entry points into knowledge. So not just the standard drawing or writing that we might think of, how can we offer many different languages for the child, not languages as in English or Spanish or Italian, although that's wonderful too, but um, languages as the different mediums into, under, into their understanding, so blocks was the work is needed. So um, they have a wealth of resources. They use a lot of recycled materials, but they also just have different, different textures of papers, different types of watercolors and pastels and clay and wires and lots of different mediums for the children to express what they're thinking, what they're wondering about, and have just different ways to uh, communicate. So in the classrooms, there's a mini atelier, besides an art room, which is a bigger atelier, uh, where they can work in small groups, and they have lots of resources, and it's just as we want them to cultivate their expressive capacity, and so the teachers themselves have to, and you as parents, like if you want your child, if you really want to understand the value of play, you need to play with play, play yourself, which is fun. And our teachers do that too. We spend time with the we next year we've chosen in the experimental school to explore three different types of materials. And so we're going to have professional development around that. And the teachers are going to play with it themselves before we play with it alongside the children. So we know what the potential it has for helping them to express whatever it is they're trying. Um, but no materials restricted, so kids can start with water when they're little. You see babies uh, with the big mound of clay, you see it at other studio too. So you might not think of exposing to them to things, but like as Mr. Murphy said earlier about that and dirty, we want them to get dirty with kind of things on the table. And we want to give them the time to explore it too. So we, um, if we're really going to look at researching how children learn and learning alongside of the child, we really need to be paying attention. So uh, at Wonder Studio, um, we put out wire, and I put it out in this context of just the wire. Well, actually, when I first did it, I was not brave, and I thought, can I really just put out wire? What if it's not attractive? And I really agonized over this. I agonized, I've agonized over every detail for years, um, so that's nothing new. But, um, so the first two days, I believe, Monday and Tuesday, I put, it, I put out the wire, I had dinosaurs, I had a pencils and paper and the wire, um, and the wire was forgotten about. The, the dinosaurs were the, the big hit, of course. So then by Wednesday, I said, Shannon, just do the wire and see what happens. Um, can we trust ch that children will see just one, just wire? 
and be able to transform it in a way of storytelling, language development, will they be able to see such a simple material and, and make it beautiful? And um, I could have just cried because it, it was so much more special when I took away all the other distractions of, of um, even in a way of my mistrust of what children uh, see and shift it to, yes, of course, when they see wire beautifully presented, I had it um, kind of separated by color, and then I had a white paper out, and, and then they could choose which color wire they wanted, and I did put the context for the parents of how does your child use wire um, to tell stories, I think is how I framed it. Uh, how did they use their imagination? And then we actually had clipboards available for the parents to write down any storytelling that was happening. Uh, of course, Remy again. Remy is one of the older students in this class and he has uh, strong verbal skills, as you've already seen. So he took the wire and um, there's sort of this phase that is called messing about, and the Reggiani adapted that from an American, David Hawkins, um, who was based in Colorado uh, years ago. And it's called this messing about phase, so where children will come see a material and kind of, you know, it, it doesn't look like they're doing much with it at first. Because they have to sort of discover this alphabet uh, of what the material can do. So it's kind of messy. It might seem chaotic at first. But then as they uh, start to understand the alphabet of this new language, this language being the, the medium of wire, they begin to get organized. And so Remy started organizing the wire um, automatically to tell this story. So he had some of the wires set up like this, and this was the hills. And then he had a, a ball of wire that he said was the hay. And he kept telling this story about the hay bouncing along the hills. And his, um, his mom and everyone at the table, the other children who also were playing with the wire, you could see everybody's listening to his story. And, um, and again, it comes back to all of a sudden Remy is contributing to the culture of that table and contributing to the culture of Wonder Studio and um, seen as this powerful person who has a story to tell. So we would like to give you the opportunity to explore um, two materials. At this table over here where the boys are, we have oil pastels. And over here we have wire. So we'll come back to the presentation in a little bit, but we wanted to take the next five to 10 minutes to give you an opportunity to maybe create life stories using these materials. Story. Let's say I mean, that's a story after the fact, but it's 
time. So I think that that's really key for all of us to remember is it's not just about having some kind of product. That's not what we're going for with kids. She's talking about this was an experience, just using the materials, feeling them. And what comes out might not appear. I think it's, it's really important when we say, what did you draw to children? How that all of a sudden it's this expectation on them. So just allowing them to even just be interested in how they did it, what colors they chose. We do a lot of process art. So just even like like if you're using one color and you're adding you know water to like two color and add water, like you see the different values that are exploring the material. So it's just actually just being engaged with the material itself and not like the result of that time. You have to share about the story. Um, you know, you're tempted to bring home a picture and say, you know, what is that? And I learned to stop asking that because one day she brought something home and I said to her, oh, what is that? And she said, oh, mom, she said, it's abstract. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean abstract? She said, you yeah, know, abstract art. And I'm like, apparently not. What is abstract art? She goes, it's just where you draw and you don't have anything in mind. You just draw. And I said, okay. And I said, so it's not epic? She said, no. It's abstract. <laughs> it's not abstract anymore unless she says it's wrong because I got, I got taught what abstract art was by my uh, four-year-old. <laughs> well, and I think that in a way, uh, when you say uh, uh, what, is, what is it, you're wanting a conversation, right? That's why right. you're asking. But in a way, when you say what is it, and to the child, it might be seen, seen as an end to the conversation. So looking at ways of asking questions to children about what they're doing in an open way of how, how can I start a conversation about this? You know, tell me about this. Tell me about that. Children, remember when this happened, uh, and they'll show the children the video, and then they might ask them to represent what happened in a using a different language. So when you recreated this with the wires, it's fascinating to me because if you think about, well, how did that shift your perspective of what happened, what you saw happen? So you have all these perspectives. You were there. Okay. And then you see the video, and then we created it through the wire. And then how seeing it at all these different angles. I mean, that's what art is, right? It, it shifts our perspective and hopefully asks us to look at things from different angles and open up our perceptions. So I think it's really neat that you decided to do that. And it, and it can deepen your understanding of the experience that has that possibility. That makes me wonder if Remy's mom had come back to him after he made the slide and asked, now can you draw a picture of the slide, mm -hmm. if you would have been more open to it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and documenting that, if Remy's mom watched that video of him with, together, and then that could be a relaunch on springboard into using other materials or showing Shannon and the friends in the class, yeah. you know, that next step, you know, so many possibilities so many that you could, you know, go further and deeper. And it's not just, uh, okay, we're done, we did that. Um, teaching children that, oh wait, there's there's more to this, you know. Is there something, even on a, um, I love poetry and I, I love about the Reggiani, they bring poetry and philosophy into every aspect of a, ch a child's day and their day of, you know, on a deeper level, what what is happening with um, the slide for a bug? So what is happening with Shay inviting Juliet into this experience? And how does it how does it change and evolve as they get older and they, they probably will join um, are they gonna join Alpha the same year? So, yeah, so it's just be their relationship. Sherry, you should be in the same class. <laughs> <laughs> We would like to give you the opportunity to ask 
questions, and then at the end we'll close with some pictures from inside the schools. Um, they do not, I think you might have told them that they don't let you take pictures inside their school, so I do have some slides of pictures in their side of the school because I wanted to get, you know, that they that they gave to, permission. That they gave permission. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't steal any pictures. Yeah, that's true. I should have that. Just, that, just, that, that was a big situation. Right, right. We didn't get a talk. We did not take a picture. But there are people who were. I bought. I bought. Yeah. <laughs> Every morning we received a lecture about people who were sneaking pictures and videos. <laughs> so we were like, oh, it was nice. But I, I, I did. Uh, purchase some images to share with you that have that I feel are very telling of things that well they inspired us some of the people that we think that just were supposed to but they did crazy American first or no. No, we actually don't know who they are, but they publicly say that. Yeah. <laughs> well they didn't say their names, but yeah. they it's like out there. And I kept thinking well you have to have some natural consequence of that but it's the same over and over again, they should have some sort of like, you know, you're telling all of us, but we're all not doing it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but anyway. Do they go to school all year? Um, they yeah. don't go to school all year. They, they give them, they do have this on the off, that they do, but they have their projects are year-long investigations, and over the summer, because they are like three years, like they're in the um, army, the infant toddler centers or the preschools where you put the same teachers for three years. Over the summer, they give the family something to do, some sort of research. So when it, and they start with that and then they launch investigations the next year. So they have that connection from one year to another. So they're not so, can I tag on to that? Just one more question. Yeah. How's their car going? No, no, it's a it's a huge them. deal. Yeah. It's a huge deal. Not they don't do car sure. they don't believe in them. Yeah. And they they the entry point and they talk about this is transition from the the parent leaving the child as this really important time. And so each school has a piazza because this is part of the Italian culture and their cities is having piazza city squares. Each school has a square. And, and this is, um, they, they do projects on this, this delicate balance of the parent leaving the child saying goodbye and how they can make that a beautiful experience. So one of the projects that we heard about um, was one of the schools felt like they weren't giving enough attention to this this time in the morning when the parents are dropping off the kids. So they decided to launch a uh, sort of research on how could music affect this drop off. So what they did was they decided to play, and this is only in one of the schools, there's probably over 35 schools, preschools in the area. So at one of the schools, they had a, a said this is the kind of director of the, of the longer projects and also the art kind of facilitator. He decided that he wanted to play traditional Italian, um, what's his name? They played the Tarantella. Yes, the Tarantella. But it was really beautiful Tarantella. This was, I still haven't been able to find this particular song. So they, they had it kind of kind of loud in throughout the school but focused in the piazza because when the children are coming to the center all the different ages the parents are dropping them off in this center area kind of like what the center area yes, is like we have our piazza yes so and then they they watched the educators and they interviewed the children they interviewed the parents how does it feel to have this music um, and the kids were dancing, the parents were dancing. They had one of the dads who said, this just starts my day off in such a beautiful way. I go to work a lot happier. And they, they had video of the um, children walking in and it's quiet outside and then you can hear in the video as they get closer to the school, you can hear the music. 
and how the child's face kind of changes. Yeah. 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 It's really, really beautiful. So it's a very good question. And they were, they were playing to him. What time mm -hmm. do they start school? Marching around. It's like four to seven minutes in the morning mm -hmm. as they were coming in. They were like celebration. We went through one of the kiosks that was close to our hotel. And we walked there every year. Space, we can transform that. That's something, every part of their day is very intentional. It's something that I brought back immediately to my teachers and then I talked to Mr. Murphy about how can we, you know, can we have parents walk in, can we not have parents walk in? You know, that's something that we're studying because that time is it's one of the things of our day. Um, you can't focus on everything at the same time. But it is important to us. I did have a conversation with the teacher yesterday too about the fall and those building those relationships and the connections and how many different opportunities are we going to invite, ways of inviting our families in. Because that's what it's about. We want to be here. We want the families to be engaged, whether you want to come to a parent workshop, whether you want to volunteer in the classroom, whether you want to have lunch with your child, for every parent, it's different, right? And for every um, caregiver. But we want to have multiple ways for our families to feel like this is our school. You know, that you're you're welcome all the time in some way to come in um, and be a part. And we're going to extend that to you, too, with projects. So that's something that we're trying to build up is this connection. Um, we, we do have a problem with uh, parking on campus, so that is a little bit prohibited to us all walking in the way I would dream that we could. That's, it's not a reality that we currently have. But it is a wonderful question. No, but we, we feel welcome like we described already, so I'm sure they'll continue to get better and better. I appreciate the, uh, the answer. Uh, I, I, sure. I want to. So, do you want to say one more thing before I show like some pictures? Well, and I just I've been having some questions about just the structure of the, the day and okay. the schedule, uh -huh. which I think is, is nice to share. So she asked first, what is the the time of the drop off? And from my understanding, the kids could be dropped off anytime from 7.30 to 9 a.m. They hoped that all the children would be there by 9 a.m. because that's when they do ask the children to kind of go to their actual classroom. So rather than being in the center's piazza space, around 9, they're all having group class meetings with their teacher. Each classroom had, uh, it's a large class of about 26 students in each class. Granted, they have two to three teachers of equal status, it was my understanding, um, in leading the class. So then she asked about nap time. And yes, it's really um, a setup, beautiful, especially in the Nido, which is the zero to three. And they have, um, they don't do cribs. This is not something that they do in Italy. They have beautiful, it looks like a nest. nest. I can't even describe it, but it's like a big uh, Moses basket, kind of. I don't know if you guys you know those, but it's big. So it's very big. They're right next to each other. Here in America, we have licensing standards where cribs have to be measured exactly like a foot in between or longer, 18 inches between each one. They're all stuffed next to each other <laughs> in a beautiful way because they they want the child to sleep in the, the basket, but they also want the, the freedom of the child to, when they wake up, they, are, they can get out themselves and they can go into another room and play. So they, they have that. And then the older kids at preschool, uh, the three to six year olds, they had cots that I could see. It's very similar to what um, you guys have, right? The, the little uh, cots, but they all bring, uh, they all were really cute laid out of having their special blanket, their special little stuffed animal, similar to what you guys do. And their day is really like our day here. Um, they, they all stay through lunch, which next year everybody's going to stay through lunch here. And then some kids go home after uh, rest time. Um, and then other kids stay all day and then they do have extended care also. I want to show you some pictures before we close up, just to give you can see from one space to another. You can put something below. Off. So 
here that even this vest had glass on them. And there's some common elements you'll see in all of the schools. So the environment is really important because, you know, it supports the philosophy and that the interactions and the relationships they have to help cultivate between the spaces and between the people. So Chad was talking about the sense of theosophy, the sense of theosophy in this one school. And theosophists are used for meeting spaces, for faculty meetings, and also for parent meetings within the school as well. And they meet with the city leaders, which I thought was just fascinating. So their, their preschools, a fifth of the city budget goes to these preschools. So these preschools are for everyone in the city. They, the parents pay tuition based on their income. So that was really an important piece of the whole city, and it's just Reggio Emilia, Italy. It's not all over Italy. It's just this particular city in Italy where they have designed a city that focuses so much in providing the best educational experience for its children that the city pay, helps to pay for the kids to go to these schools. So, it really, so the educators meet with the city leaders. There's this um, reciprocal kind of relationship of informing each other and uh, as well as contributing to the to the culture. So this is showing you again that transparency and also a lot of the schools are set up in a circular way um, so that all the spaces are connected. The classrooms are very interesting. A lot, a lot of the schools are either old homes or apartments that were converted or warehouse spaces that were converted. So each classroom in itself had like four classrooms within it. So you would have lots of interesting spaces to utilize for your class. So they are based on a, a Piagetian philosophy of how the environment teaches the child. And so how you have things in an environment um, is critical to the education of the child. So then, um, and then learning about Mygotsky, who then added in the aspect of not just the child learning through an environment and how the teacher sets up the environment, but also how the child is influenced by the other people around them. So while the pictures can be very beautiful, and it's quite overwhelming at times to be there and to see this. Um, there were also, at this center, especially this was the Morris Malaguzzi Center that they built after Morris Malaguzzi passed away. And um, they made this, what Morris Malaguzzi had always seen the school as having the possibility of having many different laboratories, almost. So areas where, um, they had areas where the child could, they called it the tinker room, I think. So they had all kinds of DVD players and things that the child could take apart and fit back together, wires. So that was like one space. And then they also have the ateliers, which are the kind of art rooms where they're exploring the other languages of children. And then, but they, they also recognize that there needs to be small little spaces where only one or two children can sit because there are times in a child's day where they need to be alone. And having this, they're spending all day in this space, um, I thought it was really beautiful that they recognize that children, just like uh, adults do as well, we need space to ourselves and we can get away, you know, and only a few people get. And so not only do we want multiple perspectives of thinking, one way to create that is by having all these different levels in a group. So you see that the stuff and building on different levels, you see things from different perspectives. There's a lot of uh, you know building on mirrors or looking through windows, drawing things from the bottom, drawing things from the side. Just a lot of different perspectives. And, you know, we're talking about really intentionally using spaces 
so that they're uh, not only statically neutral, but they're also they're learning from the space and the Yes, they call the environment the third. And learning is, is uh, multidisciplinary, just like in here. So everything, you know, you're not having the time to study math, and you're not having the time to study music, or art, or language, or literacy. It's all woven into their investigations and in their ways. And that's the way the space is looking at that, too. The technology is a huge component to everything that we're doing, which really was fascinating. Uh, Listen, guys, we, this could be a week-long course that we can have you guys go in a lot of different directions, so I'm going to stop it. Okay, that was my last slide. But, um, you know, it's very exciting to see. One of the things I was surprised about is that when we go back to study in engineering schools, they always say, because it's a lot connected to nature, which they have. And you always think of the walls being lengthy and distance, and it's not college all the students are. So it's really surprising to see there's a lot of color. There were colors in every single school there was lots of color. Uh, there are specific colors, you know, they, I'm sure that they said why they use those colors. Yeah. Really not really connected. I need to discuss more about that. But these pastel colors were everywhere. But they did have a lot of connections between the indoor world and the plants up in the sky. There were a lot of the same kind of materials and experiences that you know available to children like what we have and what we do with the So it's very important for us as well. And that's really it for our presentation. Unless you have any other questions for us, we thank you so much for your time and your interest. And I look forward to learn alongside you more than